largely because of his discovery of how wonderful small molecules spectroscopy is in his class. So he will have some adulatory things to say, and it's not only Trevor who's here, but Sophie. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I just to kind of get the normal introductory comments out of the way, uh, Michael Morscott is. PhD and did a postdoc at the University of Chicago, uh, as well as a postdoc at Rice University working with Rick Smalley. Um, but, and he's currently a professor at the University of Utah. Uh, but when I look at Michael Morse, those aren't really the things that I see. Uh, I see something completely different. Uh, from his statement on his research website, the University of Utah, I'm gonna read a sentence. Uh, there is nothing I like better than to be able to write up a definitive report of a new molecule which was previously unknown. Uh, and I think that, that is a great sum up of what Michael Morse does in his research, but I know him uh, as a great mentor and as a friend. Uh, if you just look up uh, on Rate My Professor, uh, <laughs> you get a few really gems of comments. Uh, and sentences like, best professor I've had and very enthusiastic about science are littered throughout this website. And uh, as in Michael's undergraduate quantum class, as well as his upper level classes, and later his lab. Uh, I fell in love with physical chemistry. Uh, Sophie, who is also here, fell in love with physical chemistry, and I'm sure there, that's just from our year. I'm sure there's many other people who have been influenced by Michael's energetic enthusiasm about science and his careful and compassionate style of mentoring students. Um, so I think that's, all I want to say, uh, I'll let his excitement roll over to all you guys. Uh, his talk is entitled Transition Metal Spectroscopy from Diatomic, Diatomic, Diatomic Metals to the Metal Carbon Bond. Uh, so, Michael. Thank you, Kevin, for editing those, um, those uh, comments from the website. I'm uh, choosing just a few <laughs> that were written by you and so <laughs> Anyway, I always start off with this slide because I like to show people where the University of Utah is. Uh, this is Salt Lake City. The university is right here in the foreground. This is the stadium, and my lab is right around in there somewhere. Um, the work I'm talking about has been supported by NSF and DOE for many years. NSF on the diatomic metal side of things, and DOE on the metal carbon bond. Um, so, um, transition. Why do we want to study transition metals? I'm not sure this needs any explanation, really. Um, those of us who are spectroscopists just like the idea of learning about things, right? Curiosity, what are these things like? How do they form chemical bonds? Um, the quantum chemists uh, try to develop methods that will actually let us calculate them, but the high density of electronic states um, really make transition metals pretty difficult. Um, and uh, I like to keep, try to keep the quantum chemists honest by providing really accurate benchmarks that they can. Um, uh, that's one, one point of view. The other thing really is I'd like to develop a qualitative understanding that I think you can get by systematically studying a whole series of molecules. So, um, the, me the method I use is probably well known to most people here. I'll just go through it very quickly. Uh, resonant two photon ionization spectroscopy. A lot of people call it REMPI. I like R2PI because it's more restricted. It specifies how many photons are involved uh, rather than REMPI where it's more than ambiguous. Um, so uh, we use usually a rotating disk of a metal sample. And from this side, we focus a uh, false gag laser, typically the second or third harmonic. And we um, use a pulse of helium carrier gas that travels down this channel, picks up the atoms. There's a short, about a centimeter long reaction zone um, where various reactions occur. Thermalization of the atoms down, I believe, close to room temperature. And then finally expansion out in supersonic expansion into the vacuum chamber where we make, or where we cool things down to um, roughly 5 to 15 Kelvin, about the coldest we've ever seen is one and a half Kelvin. We manage to get things that cold. Um, sometimes we uh, use just pure helium as the carrier gas, sometimes we add a 
small amount of a reactant gas, like acetylene or methane or silane, um, to make various other species. Um, that's the source chamber, which is here. Um, we let the beam pass through what some people would call a skimmer. It's actually a conical shaped device with about a centimeter diameter hole in it. So that's a pretty big skimmer. It um, doesn't really cultivate the beam that much, but um, it does narrow it a bit and allow us to maintain the lower pressure in the second chamber, which is um, like mass spectrometer. So using a combination of lasers, we do science here. They're accelerated up the flight tube for reflecting down to the detector here. In our other instrument, instrument, they go straight up to the detector, and it really doesn't matter. Uh, the whole point is you can calibrate it um, using this equation and get a calibrated mass spectrum. So uh, now you can produce metal containing species and detect them mass spectrometrically. But how do we actually obtain, obtain spectroscopic information? Um, that is done by the excitation process. We use a tunable laser that can be scanned. This is usually a dye laser um, through some excited state. And then immediately after that, we fire within 10 or 20 nanoseconds a um, UV laser that is capable of ionizing the excited state, but not the ground state. Um, so basically, the idea is that we will only see signal when we successfully excite with the first photon, and then it will be ionized. Over the years, we've used all these different wavelengths for the ionization wavelength, um, depending on uh, what, where the excited states we're probing lie and what the ionization energy of the molecule might be. Um, and typically, the first photon is in this range, although we've done some stuff up in the ultraviolet as well. Um, what you observe as you scan across the transition is a molecule, in this case one that has three isotopes, um, comes into resonance, the mass peak grows, and then decays. Um, there's an, is an isotope shift um, that's very obvious in the spectrum, where a different isotope will reach its maximum intensity at a different wavelength, and then decay. And in this case, the lightest isotope happens to be the most abundant, so you see it coming in. diatomic transition levels you can make in principle. Um, I'm excluding elements from the series that have no D electrons and ones that have 10, uh, the, the zinc group that has 10 D electrons and one who has electrons. So these are all the molecules that have the complications of D orbitals. Uh, in all. These, I guess, don't Almost all of these, there's no information all of, about whatsoever. Nothing. Um, uh, the ones that are in colors have been studied to some extent. And there's a wide variety of chemical bonding that can occur here. These guys are like H2. They're held together by S electron bonds. Um, relatively simple compared to the other systems here. Over here, um, scandium, yttrium, the, the early transition levels tend to have very stable S orbitals that are occupied with two electrons. So when two of these come together, there tends to be a repulsive interaction due to the S squared, S squared fermi repulsion. And um, as a result, the ground states derive from excited separated atom limits, and these guys are poorly bound. They're usually weakly bound. In the middle, there are places where you have guys that can form strong multiple bonds. Um, over here, the d orbitals are contracted more. They tend to have high spin, and they can be magnetically coupled to one another. So there are all these different things going on in these metals, and that makes them interesting and complicated. So um, as I said, only a few of them have been studied. Uh, these are the ones, this may not be up to date now, there may be more that I'm not aware of um, that are now. So let me
let me start off with the simple ones. I want to talk about coinage metal dimers, zinc, uh, copper, silver, and gold. As I said, these are the, of the H2 molecules of the transition metal series. They uh, form dimers by spin pairing the two S electrons to form a strongly bound dimer in our ground state. And uh, there's also a triplet state that, of course, um, should be nominally a bond order of zero. It does actually have some net bonding. And if that were all that were going on, it would be difficult to observe this transition because it's single to triplet. Um, however, we have actually seen it in these cases where there's gold. Um, That's not all that's going on um, in these coinage metal dimers. Uh, I'm exemplifying it with copper gold. Um, there are these excited separated atom limits where one of the atoms has been promoted to a D9S squared state. And it could be the gold, it could be the copper, it could be a different spin order component of the copper. Uh, the other spin order component of excited gold is way up much higher in energy. So, um, there are a lot of molecular states that arise from those limits, and we see them when we probe um, in this region up in here, 20 to 25,000 wave meters. Just to give you an example of the sort of spectrum we find, this is a spectrum of copper gold in the 20,000 wave meter region, and we actually see three different excited electronic states in this region. Um, with uh, vibrational levels uh, that are absolutely assignable from the isotope shifts. And to show what else we can do, if we were to zoom in on this guy, we can see rotationally resolved structure that allows us to determine the average bond length, or the rotational constant, which we then convert to get a constant. And by fitting a number of spectra like this, we're able to get um, rotational constants or inversion bond lengths to this kind of axis. So, jumping ahead. Copper, gold, we've seen all these different electronic states. They look like they all ought to correlate out to the uh, core excited um, D9 S squared states of the atoms. And selection rules dictate we can go from a state with zero angular momentum around the axis and plus uh, symmetry up to either one or zero plus. I've color-coded them here, and we've seen all of these things. And you can see this guy is not too far from these other guys, and spin orbit mixing allows this to be observable in the case of the copper gold and gold diamond. Um, okay. Something else we can do. We excite with one photon, we ionize with the second photon, we can scan the delay between actually measure directly the lifetime of the excited state, which gives a lot of information about the nature of that state. So for example here, um, the lowest energy state of gold dimer, excited state of gold dimer that's accessible, has a lifetime of 40 microseconds. Um, <coughs> copper gold, greater than 90 microseconds. These are really very long-lived states that I think you'd be hard-pressed to measure that lifetime by laser-induced fluorescence because the molecules would translate out of the viewing area. Here, um, this is one of the benefits of using the two-photon ionization process. We don't have to wait for the molecule to fluoresce. Um, we can force it to be detected by ionizing it and scan that delay. Um, the way we actually do that experiment, I'll just show you here is we shine the laser down the molecular beam axis and fire the Exner laser that ionizes it when the molecules are in front of it. So to measure long lifetimes, we're actually firing the dye laser back when the molecules are here somewhere, waiting for them to come down into the detection zone and then ionize them. And that's the one reason we shine the laser down the axis. Um, it's to gain access to those long lived states. Um, all right, so um, the other thing you notice is there's really quite a wide variation in lifetimes from greater than 90 microseconds to 23 nanoseconds. 
And I've highlighted these really short-lived ones. When you look at them, they all have one characteristic in common, namely they have, all have the zero plus symmetry. Right? All the short-lived ones are zero plus or zero u plus <coughs> symmetry. And the ones with omega equals one are much longer lived. And this actually is telling us something. Um, there is a state that does not correlate to these limits that derives from the separated ions. If we add, start from the atomic separated atom limit and add the ionization energy of copper and subtract the electron affinity of gold, we find the copper plus gold minus limit for the known energy. And if I just tack on a minus e squared over r attraction for the ions, I get this curve. So that's coming right down into this region. And of course, at some point, it will turn around due to the core repulsions and um, get a potential curve. Um, and exciting up to there is essentially moving an electron from a copper over to the gold. It's a metal to metal charge transfer which should be incredibly intense. It's a great source of oscillator strength. And um, through configuration interaction and spin orbit mixing, all of these states have the same symmetry. All of the zero states, zero plus states, pick up some of that intensity. And that's why when we look at this table, you can practically go down and, and identify which ones are the zeros and which ones are the ones, because this long lived one is this is fairly long, this one's getting a bit shorter, not so short. Um, anyway, uh, you can very often identify uh, the symmetry just on the basis of the uh, So for instance, this one has not yet been rotationally resolved. I think it's got to be an omega equals one state because it's long And in fact, that's why This long story about ion pair states, but it's going to come back again later on. We've now seen strong ion pair states in a lot of molecules, including chromium dimer, molybdenum dimer, chromium molybdenum, all the coinage metals, and uh, some more that I'll show you later on. Um, and in fact, all of the metal dimers ought to have strong transitions up in this blue region because the ionization energies and electron affinities are sort of similar for many metal dimers, and they replace the ion pair states in this region. A more complicated system. What if we open up the D shell and think about nickel dimer? The ground state is D9S1 triplet D, which combines with another triplet D ground state atom to generate, okay, triplet D, that's three times five, 15 states. Another three times five, 15 states here. When you bring them together, you get 225 states. Some of them form, spin pair the S electrons to form a bond, and you're left with D9, D9, which leads to 100 states in sort of a band. If the S electrons come together in high spin coupled, there's another 125, that, which has to put one of the electrons into the antibonding orbital, so that will be weakly found. 225 states. That's not the end of the story. There's a D8S squared triple F state of nickel that's nearly degenerate with the ground state. Which ones to the ground state depends on how you define that, whether you average over the spin orbit levels or just take the lowest spin orbit. So now we have a net three S electrons that are going to be giving us two in a bonding orbital, one in an anti-bonding orbital. We have all these different ways we can arrange the D electrons leading to 630 states. And the whole assumption between this treatment is that the D electrons are so contracted they're not overlapping and forming bonds. So 630 molecular states in there. We have the eight S squared coming in together with D8S squared, leading to a sort of like two helium atoms coming together, a repulsive interaction between the S squared orbitals. There's also D9S1 
S1 singlet couple that can come together with another D9 S1. And you can build up this artist's conception of the electronic manifold of nickel diamond. And um, 940 bound states that correlate things seems like it should be right. And out of 1621 states, 1,681 states, the spectrum is going to be complicated. Anytime you have this number of states, it's going to be complicated. Okay, there it is. This is a um, scanning in the near infrared from 900 nanometers out to 800 nanometers. Lots of transitions, but not so complicated as the D minus sign. You can find using isotope shifts the uh, vibrational uh, numbering for these levels and you can even go in and rotationally resolve them. Um, this is an example of a rotationally resolved band down around 10,670 uh, wave numbers. Um, and uh, you can even tell that nickel 58 has nuclear zero because half the line is missing. And that immediately establishes the symmetry of one of these two symmetries. All right. This is old stuff. Um, but I wanted to give you some examples of the next thing, which is um, we have all these nested states. When we excite to a vibrational level here, no matter how strongly coupled it is among all these other states, in the isolated gas phase jet pool molecule, the only thing it can do is fluoresce. And typically that has a lifetime uh, of these, for these types of transitions of a, a microsecond or so. As soon as we exceed the predissociation threshold, however, it can couple to one of these repulsive states and find a way to fall apart. And when you have so many, such a high density of electronic states, that will happen. Typically, we find this happens on a time scale shorter than 10 nanoseconds um, compared to the one microsecond that we so here. So, uh, if you simply record the spectrum across the dissociation threshold with a short delay between the excitation and ionization laser, you see these states that have short lifetimes. If you lengthen it a bit, they disappear, and you only see the ones with long lifetimes, and that allows you to fix the pre-dissociation threshold between this bubble and this bubble. Um, so we've done that, we've put in an uncertainty that's based on that separation, and we have a bond energy. That's making one, yes? I was wondering why, why some of the peaks actually seem to be growing in the lower uh, graph. Um, yeah, I think um, this is not believable. The, 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 the reason is these laser ablation sources, it's hard to really get them stable. Um, we're rotating a sample and defects in the sample cause fluctuations in intensity and so don't spend too much time worrying about that. <laughs> um, so anyway, yes, I'm claiming this is the bond energy of the molecule, but uh, how do we know it really dissociates at the thermodynamic threshold and there's not a barrier? So, um, well, we've done an experiment on vanadium dimer. This is jumping into the middle of the transition level series where there are even more density of states. It's really high. And um, in fact, it's so high that on this scale, it looks like we have a continuous absorption with some fluctuations, which may be rotation of the sample. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't say these are um, reproducible. But then we find a very sharp threshold where suddenly the signal drops quite strongly. And then we find the signal persists out a little bit longer and there's another drop. The separation between these two drops precisely matches the spin orbit excitation energy in an isolated atom. So here we're, we're, we believe we're dissociating the true ground state atoms that are work at with J equals three halves. Here, we're excited, we're pre-dissociating to, um, at this threshold, to one spin orbit excited atom and one ground state atom. And both thresholds are very sharp. You can nail them to a wave number accuracy for sure. Um, 
So I, I would say, okay, it would be odd that if it weren't dissociating at threshold, we'd see the two dissociation limits exactly separated by the spin orbit interval. Um, but maybe it could happen. Maybe those two, uh, maybe the barriers are exactly the same coming from the two limits. And you would expect barriers, maybe, because after all, this is bringing together an S squared atom with an S squared atom. They ought to be repulsive upon distance and then form a bond at a shorter distance. Um, nevertheless, I'm claiming this is an accurate measure of the bondage, the one wave number atoms. Um, and here's the experiment that proves it. Um, we've done a similar experiment where we make vanadium dimer cation in the laser ablation source. That produces neutrals as well as ions. And they get cool. We let them come out, and we do a time of flight mass selection. So we know we're dealing with B2 cation. We then scan the laser and look for production of vanadium atomic ion fragments. And we see a threshold. Um, there's some noise, background noise. This was uh, not that clean in the spectrum. And there's a paling here. We sort of extrapolated that and tried to figure out where the threshold was. We picked this point with an error bar of 15 wave numbers um, and got this done. And the thing about vanadium that makes it unique is we can do a thermodynamic cycle. The ionization energy of V2 has been very precisely measured by a tfi Zeke experiment. So that number's known. We believe we know the dissociation energy of V2 15 wave numbers accuracy. The ionization energy of vanadium atoms is known to 0.17 wave numbers accuracy. And we think we know the bond energy to be to one wave number. So if you add this number and this number and subtract this and subtract this, you should get a zero. Our cycle gives us minus 15.5 wave numbers with an error just propagating the errors all the things. So this cycle would not tie together so tightly <laughs> if, um, if uh, things did not pre-associate that <coughs> and then that pressure. And that, and that, that 15 wave number offset really comes entirely because we picked the threshold here. If we had picked it at the point of steepest rise at the inflection point, if you could sort of smooth this curve, it would have been dead on. What's going on is in V2 plus, to make the cation, you can't get it as cold as the neutral. If you try to make it cold, it ends up finding an electron and neutralizing it goes away. So these are rotationally hot molecules that are pre-dissociating earlier. <coughs> and coming back to this double threshold, that's an interesting story too. The ground state of the vanadium dimer neutral is a triplet sigma G minus, just like O2. Um, and there's a large spin orbit splitting. So the ground, absolute ground state is a zero G plus symmetry. We can excite to a one U state or to a zero U plus state. And it turns out zero U plus does not dissociate the ground state atoms. When you do the correlation diagram, the zero U plus will not dissociate if it's rotating, it can couple to the 1U states and dissociate. But if it's not rotating, it cannot. So this little bit of signal that we have down here really, I think, is probing the 0U plus states that are produced in J equals 0. Um, anyway, and, and we did find that intensity of that thing varied depending on our, our source condition. So um, we've been using this now, and we've measured pre-dissociation thresholds to high accuracy in about 30 different molecules. Here's a list of them. Um, I always like to present this list to the theoreticians as a challenge, because there's nothing more difficult to calculate than an accurate bond energy. 